Well, here we are on the last service of the last holy day of the seven days of unleavened bread. We've been celebrating this festival uh, here for the last week, a uh, time when we have been uh, avoiding leavening, and in its place have been taking in the unleavened bread, something that uh, we don't normally eat uh, uh, the rest of the year. You know, pity the poor store uh, that was running a week late on their delivery of matzahs. Uh, they just, you know, for some reason, they just would sit there. People uh, are not uh, not ready to buy them for, for just about another year. But we've been focusing here the last week on avoiding leavening and in its place eating unleavened bread. We, uh, of course, all uh, had a had a wonderful meal. The Days of Unleavened Bread are closely connected with another festival, the, uh, day of pa- the, the Passover. And yet, the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread, while very closely interconnected, are two separate festivals. And they emphasize different things. And that's something that we need to look at because as we look at the whole plan and purpose of God, you know, sometimes people who began to understand the truth. And they look at their lives, and they look at the things that they need to change, they need to get rid of, they need to leave behind. And sometimes it can be just sort of overwhelming. A, you know, you look at it and you think, I I just, well, I don't know if I can, I, I don't know if I can make it. Have you ever felt that way? Maybe just a little bit discouraged, a little bit overwhelmed, some of the things you saw. It, it just seemed like the, uh, you know, it was such a, a huge obstacle that we had to contend with. Well, understanding this day that we are here celebrating today, this final day of unleavened bread, helps us to put in perspective any of the discouragement, any of the things that sometimes can, can come at us and just seem pretty overwhelming and pretty difficult. Understanding also the difference between the Passover and the days of unleavened bread uh, ties in very directly with this. These days are very closely connected, and yet there's a distinction. The Passover focuses in on God's redemption. The fact that we are redeemed, we are uh, we're, we're the purchased possession of Jesus Christ. That He gave His life in exchange for us. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But the the days of unleavened bread go on beyond our redemption and focus on our deliverance. Now, seven is the number of completion in the Bible. You go all the way back to Genesis uh, chapter 1. Genesis 1 and 2, and we read about creation week, and we read of the seven days of creation. You think God just rushed as hard as He could, and He was huffing and puffing, and finally He got to Friday afternoon, and, and He was ready to sit down and take a break. It was just, you know, that was as fast as He could get it done. Well, of course not. God could have done it at any time frame He chose. He chose to inaugurate the seven-day week and to set aside, to sanctify the seventh day, to hallow it by resting. But throughout the Bible, beginning in Genesis 1 and coming all the way back to the book of Revelation, when you read about, you know, seven churches and seven candlesticks and seven seals and seven... uh, uh, you know, seven, 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 you know, seven over and over. You can read about the uh, uh, the seven trumpets and the seven last plagues, and and uh, you read about this number all the way throughout the book. And in between Genesis and Revelation, over and over, we see this pattern of seven. Seven is a number of completion. It is a number of of perfection. The seven days of unleavened bread were selected, set aside for a purpose. Just as the Passover pictures our redemption, the days of unleavened bread uh, picture our deliverance. Just as Israel of old was delivered from Egypt, so are we as the people of God delivered, completely delivered, perfectly delivered, as symbolized by the seven days of deliverance, the seven days of unleavened bread. And the fact that our deliverance is guaranteed and assured is really what we're celebrating here today. Because our deliverance 
is made sure if we simply continue to follow where Jesus Christ leads. Now let's go back to the book of Exodus chapter 12. I, I want to, uh, from time to time people get confused. There have been a lot of confusion on all sorts of things in recent years. Uh, and from time to time people get confused about what is the difference between the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread. If you uh, look, uh, most of the Jews uh, celebrated the night that we celebrated as the night to be much observed. They celebrated and called it Passover. And uh, uh, they customarily celebrate the Passover on the evening that begins the seven days of unleavened bread. In effect, uh, completely obliterating any evidence, any indication that these are two separate festivals focusing on redemption and deliverance. And one follows the other. Let's uh, notice here in, Levi- in uh, Exodus chapter 12 uh, very briefly. In Exodus chapter 12, Moses was instructed uh, to tell the Israelites that this particular month that was beginning, undoubtedly, it was at the time of the uh, new moon, the beginning of the month, that that was to be reckoned from now on as the beginning of month, first month of the year, the month that we uh, know as Abib. And he was told to tell them in verse 3 that the tenth day of the month, uh, each family was to select a lamb. And then they were told that they were to keep it, verse 6, up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and they were to kill it uh, in the evening. The blood was to be put on the doorposts. That, in verse 12, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, man and beast. And I will (coughs) execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. This day was to be a day of remembrance, a day for a memorial, uh, we're told in verse 14. Then verse 15, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall have put away, that's the sense of it, you shall have put away leavening out of your houses. Whosoever eats leavened bread from that first day till the seventh, that soul shall be cut off. The first day is a holy convocation. And... uh, uh, you're to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, verse 17. For in this selfsame day have I brought your armies, your multitudes, out of the land of Egypt. You see, the Days of Unleavened Bread celebrate deliverance. They, that celebrates our deliverance from Egypt. The Passover celebrates the fact that the death angel would pass over the homes that were under the blood of the Lamb. They were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb because the firstborn throughout all the land of Egypt was going to be struck dead. But those that had the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost, that blood represented their redemption. They were passed over. But that was to set the stage for what came next. And that which came next was deliverance. The days of unleavened bread celebrate bringing the multitudes out of the land of Egypt. Now, we're told that we're not to have leavening in our homes, verse 19. Uh, We're not to eat it. And we're told that we are for seven days to eat unleavened bread. Now, let's go back to the question, and I I want to resolve the matter fairly quickly to show you uh, this matter of was the, uh, that the Passover was completely distinct from the days of unleavened bread. Now, to understand something, throughout the Old Testament, the word that is translated evening is the Hebrew word erev. You would spell it out in English, uh, E-R-E-V, erev. Now, what do, exactly does erev mean? You know, a lot of times when people get into this and they get all tangled up and they quote Rabbi so-and-so and this fellow said this, and the Talmud said that. You know, the Bible defines its own terms. The simplest way to find a definition of what God was using something to mean in Scripture is to look and see how He uses it in Scripture. Erev, which means evening, is very easily defined. When does evening begin? What what, what is that? Well, let let me just show you a couple of verses. Leviticus chapter 22 and verse 6. We'll, we'll note to begin with. Here's talking about uh, defilement, and it says in Leviticus 22, 6, 
The soul which has touched any such shall be unclean until even, until Erev, and shall not eat of the holy things unless he wash his uh, flesh in water. And when the sun is down, he shall be clean and shall eat afterward of the holy things because it is his food. This is talking about the priests. And uh, notice verse 6 says, He shall be unclean until evening, until Erev. Verse 7 says, And when the sun is down, he shall be clean. When is Erev? Erev is sunset, isn't it? He's to be unclean until Erev, until evening. And when the sun is down, the sun has set. When sunset occurs, he's now clean. Now, let's, let me show you. We'll just look at one other place. Uh, there are a number of places we could go, but, but I think two will suffice to make the point. Joshua chapter 8. Joshua chapter 8. And uh, we read that uh, in verse 28, Joshua burned Ai. And he made it a heap forever, even a desolation of this day. And the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until eventide. Now, this is that exact same word, Erev. It's used dozens and scores of times throughout the Old Testament. The king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until evening, until Erev. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded, they should take his carcass down from the tree. When was Erev? Sunset. As soon as the sun is down. Sunset. Now, let's just go back to Leviticus 23 and let me show you one other thing. Leviticus 23, the, the, folk, the uh, chapter that deals with the holy days. We're told in Leviticus 23, 27, on the tenth day of the seventh month there shall be a day of atonement, a holy convocation. We're given instructions uh, about not doing any work, afflicting our souls. And in verse 32, it shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. You shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at Erev, at evening, at sunset. From evening to evening, from Erev to Erev, shall you celebrate your Sabbath. The day of atonement is to be when? On the tenth day of the seventh month. That's what it said uh, in verse 27. When does it begin? It begins at Erev. That concludes the ninth day. The ninth day at sunset. You know, sunset can is the point that ends one day and it begins the next. It is the ending point and it's also the beginning point. So, when the sun sets at the conclusion of the ninth day... You afflict your soul until the time the sun sets next. The next day, the tenth day, from sunset at the end of the ninth from sun to sunset at the end of the tenth. That's the day of atonement. From Erev to Erev shall you keep your Sabbaths. So, this is the basis on which we understand that the Sabbath begins at sunset. Now, let's go back to Leviticus 12, or to Exodus 12, and let me show you something that is not apparent in most English translations. It's not apparent in the King James. Some other English translations will give you a little different rendering. Uh, the Jewish translation and others will, will give you a little bit different rendering. Leviticus, or Exodus 12 and verse 6 talks about the Passover lamb, and it says, You shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, it reads in the King James. But that's not actually, it's not the Hebrew word Erev here. <clears throat> it is a phrase that is only used in about five places in the entire Old Testament. It is a longer Hebrew phrase, uh, literally, Ben Ha Erevin, which uh, uh, a literal translation would be son of the evenings, uh, or between the two evenings. Most uh, English translations that render it uh, will, uh, will render it dusk or twilight. Now, let me ask you, how do you know that this phrase, ben ha Erevim, refers to the period of dusk or twilight? In other words, the period after sunset and before total darkness. Well, the simplest way to, to establish that is to look at the few places in Scripture that it's used. It's only used about five locations in the Old Testament. 
And when you look at those five locations, it's very apparent the time period that's being referred to. Remember, the day ends and the new day begins at sunset. So, if we're looking at twilight on the 14th, if you keep it up until twilight of the 14th, twilight of the 14th is only the beginning part because when the sun sets on the 13th, you begin then the 14th. And that period of twilight, uh, you know, this evening when the sun sets, the days of unleavened bread will be over. Now, it won't be pitch dark the minute the sun goes down. There will be a period of dusk, a period of twilight. And uh, now let me show you. If you come back uh, to uh, a little further, to Levitic, uh, to Exodus 16, this is the story of Israel on their way uh, out of Egypt. They uh, uh, have come out, and we uh, find in uh, Exodus 16, verse 1, they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. Now, when did they leave Egypt? Well, they left Egypt on the fifteenth day of the first month. So now... We're exactly a month later. They've been gone. They started their exodus 30 days ago. They have now come. Now, I want to show you something here in Exodus 16 that you may not have noticed. Uh, from Exodus 16, we can determine the days of the week in the year of the exodus. I'll show you in just a few moments that the 15th day of the second month was a weekly Sabbath. It was a weekly Sabbath. Now, uh, if you want to do a little figuring, if you've got uh, uh, something, you can. If the fifteenth day of the second month, if the fifteenth is a uh, weekly Sabbath, then that means what? That a week earlier, the eighth would have been a weekly Sabbath. And if you go back further, then a week earlier, the first would have been a weekly Sabbath. And then, if you want to go back to the next week, you'll find that the twenty-fourth would have been on a weekly Sabbath. And a week earlier, the 17th would have been on a weekly Sabbath. Now, the 17th day of the first month would be right during the middle of the Days of Unleavened Bread, right? Sort of a, a little... You can figure it out if you want to just uh, number it out, check my math. Uh, seven, if the 17th day of the first month was on a weekly Sabbath, that means that the 15th day, which was the first holy day, would have been two days earlier. That would have been on a Thursday which means that the 14th, the Passover, would have been on a Wednesday. Which is very interesting. It doesn't necessarily prove some great significant thing, but it is interesting that the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread on the, in the year of the Exodus fell in exactly the same way as they did in the year Christ was crucified. For the Passover also came on Wednesday and the first Holy Day on a Thursday. If, uh, like I say, you can, just, you can just add it together. If the 17th is on a Sabbath and the 24th is on a Sabbath... Uh, the first day of the second month is on a Sabbath. The eighth day of the second month is on a Sabbath. And the fifteenth day of the second month is on a Sabbath. Now, how do we know the fifteenth was on a Sabbath? Okay, they've come here uh, to encamp right here uh, at the beginning of the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing. Now, notice what happened. Let's just go on down through the story. Verse 2, the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. They got here 30 days after the exodus. They set up camp and began to complain. Now, why did they start complaining? Well, they said, we wish we just died in the land of Egypt when we had plenty to eat. You brought us into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. You see, they had provisions for a month. Now they have arrived. A month has passed. They're here at the 15th day of the, of the second month, and they are out of food. And they begin to complain. The Lord told Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go forth and gather at a certain rate every day that I may prove them, whether they'll walk in my law. And it'll come to pass on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it'll be twice as much as they gather daily. Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, At Erev, at sunset, you shall know that the Lord has brought you out from the land of Egypt. In the morning, tomorrow morning, at sunset, you're going to find out that God is really the one who has brought you out. And tomorrow morning, in the morning, 
You shall see the glory of the Lord for that he hears your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we you murmur against us? Moses said, this shall be. When the Eternal shall give you in the evening. When he shall give you in the evening at sunset. Erev. When he shall give you at Erev flesh to eat and in the morning bread to the full for that the Lord hears your murmurings that you murmur against him. Moses spoke unto Aaron, tell the congregation, come near before the Lord. He's heard your murmurings. It came to pass as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation that they looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of the eternal appeared in a cloud. And the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them saying, at evening you shall eat flesh. Now here the word is not Erev. It's that same word used back in Exodus 12, ben ha Erevin, translated in some of your translations as at twilight or dusk. Tell them at twilight, at dusk, at ben ha Erevin, you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you'll be filled with bread, and you will know that I am the Lord. And it came to pass that at evening, at Erev, at sunset, the quails came up and covered the camp. All right, the 15th was on a Sabbath. They were complaining, they were hungry, uh, they were murmuring, and God told Moses, tell them at sunset they'll find out. They looked up and in the distance they saw the glory of God in a cloud. And when the sun set at Erev, at sunset, quails came up. So just at sunset, the quails came up and covered the camp. And when did they eat the quails? as soon as they could lay hands on them and pluck them. When did they eat them? They ate them at ben ha Erevin. They ate them at dusk, at twilight. The quail came at sunset. The Sabbath was over. They grabbed the quail. They very quickly, you know, plucked off their heads, plucked them, cooked them. They were eating at twilight. They weren't doing all of that on the Sabbath. They were doing it after the Sabbath was over. The Sabbath ended at sunset. Twilight was the beginning of the next day. Just like at Passover, the twilight period of the 14th was the beginning of the 14th. Just like this was the beginning of Sunday, the first day of the week. Now, let's go on down. I'll show you even further. So, end of verse 13. In the morning, the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said unto one another, It's manna. For they didn't know what it was. Now, we're learning Hebrew words today. You've already learned Erev. You've learned uh, Ben Ha Erev. Manna is a Hebrew word. And it means, what's it? That's what they said. See, they came out there and they said, it's manna. They said, what's it? What's that? They saw all this stuff around. See, boy, you'd be chattering in Hebrew by the time this is over. Every time you see something, you say, manna. You know, what's that? Uh, They said, it's, what's it? But they didn't know what it was. And Moses said, this is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating. Uh, You gather uh, an omer, about a quart, for every man according to the number of your persons. And take it to the tent. And they did that. Moses told them, verse 19, Now don't leave any of it until morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not to Moses. Always a few hard heads. They didn't want to run short. Some of them left of it until the morning. And boy, did they have an appetizing looking breakfast. It had bred worms and stank overnight. So they got up in the morning, you know, they had their little stash, and they got it out, and here maggots crawling all over the thing, and it stinks to high heaven. Well, I don't imagine anybody wanted to eat what they had said. That, that was, uh, uh, Moses was wroth with them. Oh, he was upset. Couldn't believe it. I told you. God sent it. I told you not to say that. Sure enough, you know, all he had to do was just walk down the row of the tents, and he could smell it coming out of some of these tents. Well, they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. The sun waxed hot and it melted. It came to pass on the sixth day they gathered twice as much, two omers for the man. And the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses, and he said, Now this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake what you'll bake today, seed what you'll seed, and that which remains over, lay it up 
to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up until the morning, as Moses told them, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. You shall not find it in the field. Six days you'll gather it on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath. In it there shall be none. All right. When did he start giving them the manna? They collected it for six days, which means it had to start Sunday morning, didn't it? Sunday morning, Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning. Six days. The sixth day, they got a double portion, and then the seventh day, no manna came. So that brings us right back, you see. The fifteenth day of the second month was a Sabbath. At evening, at sunset, the quail came. The Sabbath was now over when the sun had set. The quail came, and between the two evenings, at dusk, at twilight, ben ha Erevim, they ate the quail, and the next morning, the manna was there. And they gathered the manna beginning that next morning, Sunday morning. They gathered it six days. And Friday, they gathered a double portion, and then was the Sabbath. So as you go through and put the story together, this is when God fed them. Now, we see the layout of, of the days, but we also see how the Bible defines this phrase, Ben Ha Erevin, because this is the second place it's used, Exodus 16. It refers to the twilight, which begins a new day. Because God wouldn't have, uh, you know, the Sabbath was over before all of this was going on. Now, I'll just come on over to Exodus 29. Let me show you very briefly the other places that this term is used. Exodus 29, 39. Here it talks about the evening and the the uh, uh, the daily sacrifices which were offered every morning and every evening. Uh, verse 38 of Exodus 29. This is that which you shall offer upon the altar. Two lambs of the first year, day by day continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at evening or at dusk. Ben ha erevin. This is again third place this phrase is used. You're to offer the first one in the morning and the second one you offer at dusk. And uh, it goes through and describes how the morning one is offered in verse 40. And verse 41, the other lamb you shall offer at evening, at ben ha Arevim, at twilight, at dusk. And that's what you're to do. Now, as you come on into Exodus chapter 30, the next place that is used. Exodus chapter 30 talks about how Aaron, verse 7, shall burn on the altar of incense, sweet incense, every morning. When he dresses the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at Eden, it says in the King James, but the Hebrew is, again, this phrase, fourth place, fourth chapter in the Bible where it's mentioned, ben ha Erephim, at dusk, at twilight. When Aaron lights the lamps... At twilight, at ben ha Erevim, he shall burn incense upon it, perpetual incense before the Lord. When would you light the lamps in the tabernacle? Are you going to light them at noon or three o'clock in the afternoon? The logical time to light the lamps is when? At dusk. After sunset and before it gets dark. You know, and that when those of you who grew up with coal oil lamps, when did you light them? They lit the lamps in the tabernacle. Now, early in the morning, they left the lamps burning all night. So in the morning, after sunup, Aaron came in, and what did he do? He dressed the lamps. You know, you know those of you who've had, uh, had lamps that way, you know what you do. You have to trim off the part, that, the, the burn part. So you've got something fresh. So he, he dressed the lights. You see, he didn't need the lamp after the sun came up. So the, the lamps went out, and he trimmed them early in the morning. And he made he, he burned incense on the altar at that time. And then... At twilight, at dusk, he came in and he lit the lamps. So it's very clear when you go through that the Passover was to be slaughtered. Was When were they to keep the Passover? Or when, when were they to observe it? At twilight, at dusk. When, were they, when did they eat the quail? At twilight, at dusk, after sunset. When the quail arrived at sunset, they ate it at twilight. When did Aaron trim the lamps? At twilight, at dusk, or, or light lamps, rather. The other place, the other, there's one other chapter, and that's Numbers 9, where it gives instructions for the second Passover. The second Passover was just like the first one. It was done between the two evenings, by ben ha Erevin. So, what we look at here, what we look at is that there is a clear distinction that the Passover was at the beginning of the 14th, at twilight at the beginning of the 14th. Now, 
Coming back here to Exodus chapter 12, we'll pick it up in verse 29. It came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn of the land of Egypt. Verse 30, Pharaoh rose up in the night. You see, they had observed the Passover, they had slaughtered the lamb, uh, and had carried out the Passover instructions at twilight at the beginning of the 14th. Uh, they had eaten their meal, and now at midnight on the 14th, the angel passed through the land and passed over those who had the blood on the doorpost, and the firstborn died. Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. There was a great cry in Egypt. There was not a house where there was not one dead. He called for Moses and Aaron by night. And he said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, you and the children of Israel. Now, how did he do it? Did he pick up his cell phone and give Moses a quick ring? No, he had to order a soldier to go get Moses. Now, Moses, as we're going to see as you go on through the account, Moses and the Israelites were in the area of Ramses, treasure city. Pharaoh's capital was a good 20, 25 miles away. They, loaded, they, they got a soldier on a horse... Uh, at least one, maybe more, and Pharaoh quickly dispatched them. And so they went galloping across uh, here in the wee hours of the morning, and they arrived where Moses was and banged on the door and said, Look, you need to come. Pharaoh wants to see you right now. Moses and Aaron then had to travel to where Pharaoh was. They had to travel 20, 25 miles where Pharaoh was. They had their meeting, which probably didn't take very long. Pharaoh said, Please, you know, Get everything you want and get out of here. Then Moses had to come back to Ramses. So now here we are, and we're getting close to daylight. Remember, the Israelites have been told to stay in their house all night. So you've got 600,000 men besides women and children. You were not talking about you know people within three blocks of one another. Uh, 600,000 is uh, men... You know, 600,000 households, that's a whole lot bigger than the city of Little Rock. Now, they weren't scattered out that, uh, you know, that far, but they, you're looking at a pretty good distance. They had to blow the horns, blow the, uh, uh, the uh, signal horns, and people had been ready. See, they were packed up, they were ready when they heard the horn. They gathered at Ramses along with their herds and their flocks, and they began to do what? To spoil the Egyptians. We're told... That, verse 33, the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. Now, they were hurrying, but you try to get that many people together. You know, we tried to move 90 people through, through the potluck line. And it took a little while, didn't it? You're lining these folks up. You're organized. you got it planned up. you got it planned out, but it still takes a little time. You don't just, uh, you know, instantly go. Uh, because one person is in another person's way. And, and so they're urging upon them. They're hurrying. The Egyptians are telling them, please hurry up, get on out of here. The children of Israel, verse 35, or verse 34, the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. The children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. They borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver, jewels of gold and raiment. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. They lent them what re was required. They spoiled the Egyptians. The children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men besides children. A mixed multitude went up, flocks, herds, and very much cattle. They baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they brought forth out of Egypt. It was not leavened. They were thrust out of Egypt and could not carry the sojourning of the children of Israel that dwelt in Egypt completed 430 years. If you notice, if you have a King James translation, it says was 430 years, but the was is in italics. An italicized word means it was added in by the translators. You see, there is not a verb in verse 40 in Hebrew. The children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt... 430 years, you know, 400, uh, it, it completed a period of 430 years. Uh, the, the explanation is found back in the book of Galatians where we're told by Paul that the law given at Sinai was 430 years after the covenant with Abraham. Well, Genesis 17.1 is the story of the covenant with Abraham. God made the covenant and changed his name from Abram to Abraham. 
the covenant at Sinai was the same year of the Exodus. In fact, it occurred just over seven weeks after the Exodus. So if the covenant at Sinai was 430 years after the covenant with Abraham, then children of Israel leaving Egypt, completing a 430-year period, 430 years from what? 430 years from the covenant with Abraham, 430 years to the self-same day. Now, the interesting thing, God made a promise 430 years later, God begins to fulfill the promise He made. You know, a thousand years is as a day. God is counting time. You and I don't generally count it quite that way. We, we get in a little more of a hurry. But the 430 years, right to the day, that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It's a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. You see, the Passover is a memorial of God passing over Israel. But it was through the wee hours of the morning that Pharaoh sent for Moses. Moses came to Pharaoh. Moses came back. Uh, the horns were blown, blown. The Israelites began to assemble in ranks. And they are spoiling the Egyptians. They are gathering up all these things. The Egyptians are urgent upon them. Now, let me show you something. Numbers 33. Numbers 33, 1. These are the journeys of the children of Israel which went out of the land of Egypt with their armies, their multitudes under the hand of Moses and Aaron. Verse 3. They departed from Ramses on the first month, on the fifteenth day of the first month. On the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians, for the Egyptians buried all their firstborn. When were the Egyptians burying their firstborn? At 3 a.m. in the morning? Of course not. It was the daylight portion of the 15th when the Egyptians were burying their firstborn, when they were urgent on the Israelites to leave. The Israelites spent the day lining up, getting organized, uh, getting all these treasures and everything from the Egyptians, getting ready to go. They left on the morrow after the Passover. They left on the 15th. The day after the Passover is on the 14th. They left on the 15th. They removed from Ramses, moved from Ramses to Succoth. Now, just one other place, Deuteronomy 16.1. Observe the month of Bib. Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, for in the month of Abib the Lord brought you forth out of Egypt by night. That's why it's called a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. The Passover is about redemption and the days of unleavened bread are about deliverance. We celebrated the Passover celebrating our redemption by the blood of Jesus Christ. One night later, 24 hours later, you celebrated the night to be much observed. It was a night to be celebrated. Why? For bringing Israel out of Egypt because they came out by night. They came out at the the night portion that began the first holy day of unleavened bread. They began a seven-day journey that would take them all the way out of Egypt until they had finally crossed the Red Sea and they were no longer in Egypt. They began their journey. The days of unleavened bread were about deliverance. Deliverance from Egypt. Very clearly defined in Scripture as a separate and distinct festival. The Passover was at the beginning of the 14th. 24 hours later, the beginning of the 15th, is when Israel began their journey. And as you come on down through uh, Exodus chapter 13 and 14, you follow the story of Israel until they came to the Red Sea. And they got there, and they camped, and the next day, before they could do anything, they looked and the Egyptian army was coming. God sent a pillar of cloud uh, that stopped the Egyptians, that blocked between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And at sunset, that pillar was dark on one side toward the Egyptians and it was light on the Israelite side. And God sent a wind that evening, which was the evening that actually began the last holy day of unleavened bread, the equivalent of last night. God sent a wind and separated the Red Sea. And as the Red Sea was separated uh, and became... You know, there's plenty of room. Then the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. And they spent the whole night crossing. 
So it was a big group of people. It took a long time to, to move them across a particular area, even though they were undoubtedly stretched out uh, for uh, quite a distance uh, if you're moving that number of people. It says they came up by ranks. In other words, in an organized way, they were moving out. They came across, well, early the next morning, when then the cloud lifted, the Egyptians looked and they saw that the sea was divided. Now, that must have been quite a sight to them. And they saw the Israelites disappearing on the other side. Some of them must have looked around, scratched their heads, and said, I wonder how they did that. And somebody got the bright idea and said, well, if they can do it, we can too. Which was not one of his smarter ideas, whoever came up with that. But somebody thought that sounded reasonable. If they can do it, we can too. Come on, let's go get them. And so they went after them. And they got out there in the middle of the Red Sea. And guess what? The sea closed. And that was the end of the Egyptians. It says they got bogged down. You know, they were on, on uh, they were in these chariots, and chariots had a little thin wheel. Uh, evidently, God sent the, this wind across, this, this dry wind that separated the Red Sea and also put a crust, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, you know how mud will crust over, and put evidently a crust on the bottom of the sea. Well, the people were walking over, and just under the weight of, of a man's footsteps, the crust didn't break through. But, you know, when a chariot started going across, all the weight of the chariot on these little thin wheels, guess what? The chariots began to break through. The crust, God made sure the wind was just right. You know, God's a master uh, engineer. The wind was just right. It dried the mud just enough to support the weight of a man. But not enough to support the weight of a chariot. So at some point in between... Uh, it, it was, you know, that was the break point. And these chariots began to bog down, and when the water started coming at them, they couldn't go anywhere. And Exodus chapter 15, then, is the, uh, the song of Moses, the song unto the Lord, a song of celebration, a song of triumph, which was sung here during the daylight portion of this day as the Egyptians had been foiled, had been destroyed, and God's people had been delivered. Had been delivered. So here, on the last day of unleavened bread, they were celebrating triumph. They were celebrating deliverance. Now let me show you just a little further. We see all of this tying in. Now let's go back to Leviticus 23. They were told in Leviticus 23:5, the fourteenth day of the first month is Passover. The fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, the first day, verse 7, you're to have a holy convocation. The end of verse 8, the seventh day is a holy convocation. That's why we're here today. Then the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap the harvest, offering was to be made, verse 14, you're not to eat any of anything that comes from the new harvest until this offering has been brought to God. Not bread, parts, corn, green ears, no form or fashion are you to eat of the, of the harvest until you have brought this offering unto God. It's a statute forever. And then you begin counting, counting from the Sunday, the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the wave sheep, the omer of grain offering, you count seven Sabbaths are to be complete. So you start on a Sunday and you count seven Sabbaths, seven weeks. The morrow after the seventh Sabbath is 50 days. And that is the uh, that is a holy convocation. That's the day that we know as Pentecost. It's the 50th day. Seven weeks plus one day. Now, notice something. Here was instructions. This was given right early in the, in the beginning, the first year of the Exodus. But there was something they could not do for 40 years. Moses was told, tell them when, this is verse 10, when you come into the land that I give you and reap the harvest of the land, first thing you're to do is bring a sheaf of the first fruits, and then you begin to count seven Sabbaths. They couldn't offer this wave sheaf through the years in the wilderness. There was nothing for them to harvest. This was an instruction that would only apply when you're come into the land that I give you. I'll just turn back a few chapters, a few places, into the book of Joshua, chapter 5.
Joshua chapter 4, verse 19, the people, when did the people come into the land? Joshua 4, 19, the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. They crossed the Jordan River, which was the boundary of the promised land. They came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal. In verse chapter 5, verse 10, the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the month. So they crossed the Jordan on the tenth, encamped in Gilgal, stayed there, and on the fourteenth they kept the Passover. And they ate of the grain of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn, and the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the, of the grain. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they ate the fruit of the land. Now let me ask you something. They were instructed, when you come into the land that I give you, before you eat, offer the first fruits chief to God, the, the omer of the first fruits. Did Joshua do what Moses said? Well, you don't even have to guess. Because if you go to Joshua chapter 11 and verse 15, we're told that as the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all the Lord commanded Moses. One of the things Moses was told, when you come into the land, offer the sheep. Joshua did everything that he was instructed. Now, what, what this tells you in Joshua 5, by the way, is that the days of Passover and days of unleavened bread fell in the year of the Exodus exactly the way they did this year. Because when did they eat of the grain? On the morrow after the Passover. What is the morrow after the Passover? It's the first holy day of unleavened bread. When did the first holy day of unleavened bread come this year? On a Sunday. The, the wave sheet was always offered on a Sunday, on the, on the morrow after the Sabbath. Now, if it weren't for the account in Joshua 5, people could maybe argue, well, they still argue, but uh, they would have at least a little basis. Uh, they could argue and say, well, now, which Sunday do you count from? Well, you count from the Sunday that's inside the Days of Unleavened Bread. And occasionally, that Sunday may be the first Holy Day of Unleavened Bread. That's the only Sunday that came during the Days of Unleavened Bread this year, right? First Holy Day. They kept the Passover, and the morrow after the Passover, they ate of the grain. Probably on some time that afternoon, they had manna that morning. God gave them breakfast. But they offered the wave sheet. That was the first. That's, you know, you're not talking labor. You're talking one, one sheaf of grain, you, as, as much as one hand could hold, whack. That's how long it took. You know, grab it, whack. It was cut. So we're, we're, we're not looking... Uh, uh, you know, it was no more than what Christ and the disciples did when they walked through the grain fields and, and, and got off some grain to eat. They cut the sheep, and that morning they presented, they weighed the sheep. Sometime later on in the day, individual families went out and undoubtedly on that, uh, on that day just took one sheep for the family, just enough to, to have a taste of the new harvest. Because for 40 years all it has manna. Now they've entered into the land. The sheep has been presented to God. Now the harvest of the land has been sanctified. And so everybody beginning that day is able to actually eat unleavened bread. They've only had unleavened manna uh, for 40 years. Now they had grain to eat. And so everybody gets a bite. Gets a little bit. They... This was the day of the wave sheet. just so happened that it fell this year the same way it did that year. But you put the story together and there's no other way to line it up. Now, what's the significance of that? This wave sheet, this presentation. We'll go back to 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul writes... Verse 3, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He was buried, and He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, was seen of Cephas and of the twelve. After that, He was seen 
of over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain alive to this time. Some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Last of all, seen of me. He goes on to say, uh, I'm the least of the apostles, not really fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Paul tried to make up for lost, it, lost time. Now let me point something out to you with this. The Passover is God extending his grace, his mercy toward us. God commends His love toward us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. God took the initiative in our behalf. God extends His grace toward us, but Paul brings out very clearly that we are not to receive the grace of God in vain. Paul says, that grace was not bestowed upon me in vain. How did Paul ensure that God's grace was not bestowed upon him in vain? He labored. He responded to God's grace by putting forth effort. That's how you avoid receiving the grace of God in vain. God extended His grace when He passed over the Israelites in Egypt. But He didn't pass over them so that they could remain slaves in Egypt. They then had to put forth the effort to follow where He led. He led them out of Egypt. He led them across the Red Sea. They had to respond by following where he led, by putting one foot in front of the other and going forward. That's what you and I have to do. The Passover is our redemption. The days of unleavened bread represents our deliverance. And in order to have received the grace that was bestowed upon us in terms of redemption, we have to labor to follow, to go forward, to put one foot in front of the other because we are then being delivered from Egypt, being delivered from the house of bondage. Now let's go on in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 12, If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, our preaching is vain, your faith is vain. We're found false witnesses of God. If the dead are raised not, verse 16, then is not Christ raised. If Christ is not raised, your faith is in vain, you're yet in your sins. They that are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become what? the first fruits of them that slept. Since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterward, those that are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers up the kingdom to God, even the Father. Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. The first fruits of the dead. What was presented on the day of the wave sheep? The first fruits of the early harvest. And the, the harvest could not begin until after. No one was free to partake of anything until the first fruits was presented before God. Christ was piped by the offering of the first fruits on the wave sheep. It was a presentation to God. That's what it was all about. Now, notice here, let's just go back uh, to uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Jesus said, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, even so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, let's just look briefly. Luke 23. Here's the account, one of the four gospel accounts of Jesus' death. The crucifixion, the, uh, uh, the scourging, the crucifixion. And uh, <clears throat> we find that uh, uh, verse 44 of Luke 23, about the sixth hour, about noon, it began to get pitch black dark. Jesus had been taken out and fixed to the stake about nine o'clock in the morning, about the third hour. Now, about the sixth hour, about noon, this is counting from sunrise to sunset, sunset to sunrise, you know, 12 hours, uh, the, the uh, day 
the full 24-hour day was sunset to sunset, but you broke it down, uh, you know, 12 hours to the day. And uh, uh, so the sixth hour would have been noon. There was darkness. It began to get pitch black, and it this lasted until the ninth hour, until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The sun was dark. Now, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, what happened is you put all the gospel accounts together. Jesus was stabbed by a spear, and blood and water poured out, and he cried out, it is finished. You know, it, Lord, into your hands I commend my spirit. It is finished. The blood poured out on the ground. There was a great earthquake that shook the whole area. There were tombs that were even opened as a result of this earthquake. It had been pitch black. Now, in the aftermath of that, this earthquake that shook that actually split the huge veil there in the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, probably the great stone lentil that came across the whole width of the building was, was split by the earthquake. It fell down and ripped this, this uh, huge uh, curtain in two. And then the sky began to lighten. The uh, clouds began to pull back and uh, it began to, you know, in a short time become normal. Now, people were there and were told in verse 50 of Luke 23 that Joseph of Arimathea <clears throat> uh, went to Pilate and requested the body of Jesus. And uh, uh, the, uh, we, we find, as you put the other gospel accounts, Pilate sent somebody back and got the centurion posted there to guard the place to come back and assure him that, that Jesus was dead. And when he confirmed that, he gave permission. Joseph went back and took the body down. Verse 53, they took it down, wrapped it in linen, laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn, wherein, the day, wherein never a man before was laid. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. It was getting late. It was getting sunset. They uh, getting close to sunset. They had to, uh, they had to hurry, as it were. Now, John tells us something in John chapter 20 or John 19.31, that the Jews, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain on the cross for the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath was a high day. Okay, the day that Jesus was crucified, the Sabbath that Jesus was crucified right before was what? It was a high day. It was the holy day. You see, Jesus was crucified on the daylight portion of the Passover. But the Passover is always the preparation day for the first holy day of unleavened bread which comes on the 15th. So that Sabbath was a high day. Mark uh, explains to us back in Mark chapter 16. Uh, well, let, let's see. Uh, pick it up at the end of Mark 15. Uh, the, bi the body, verse 45, was given to Joseph and uh, he wrapped it, laid it in a sepulcher, rolled a stone. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. Chapter 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Now, this, let me show you, just let's go back to Luke again, put all the Gospels together. It's very plain there were two Sabbaths that week. You know, they, they had not, nobody was expecting, none of them were expecting what had happened. It was... The disciples, even though Jesus had tried to tell them and told them what was going to happen, didn't, didn't dawn on them. He was arrested. All these events happened quickly. Here he was. He was taken out. He was crucified. They're standing there. He's taken down. He's buried right before the Sabbath. The Sabbath was drawing on, we're told. They laid him in a tomb that was very close by where he was crucified. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and the others went and bought the sweet spices Luke tells us in Luke 23, verse 55, the women came with him from Galilee, followed, beheld the sepulcher, how his body was laid. They returned. They prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Well, wait a minute. Mark says they didn't buy the spices until the Sabbath was passed. After the Sabbath, they bought the spices. Luke says they prepared them and then rested the Sabbath according to the commandment. Which Sabbath? The Sabbath mentioned in the Ten Commandments, the weekly Sabbath. You see, the Passover was on a Wednesday that year. Christ was crucified on a Wednesday. Celebrated the Passover service with His disciples uh, Tuesday evening, the beginning part of the Passover. 
was crucified during the daylight period on Wednesday, was buried Wednesday just at the approach of sunset. Very quick burial. The women were dissatisfied with what had happened. Joseph and those that were with him did the best they could as quickly as they could, but it was the Sabbath. They couldn't do something. They, they uh, concluded because the Sabbath was coming on. So the women then, after the holy day, on, which was on Thursday, on Friday, the women went out and bought the things they needed, spent the day preparing it, then they rested on the Sabbath, Saturday, according to the commandment. Then what did they do? First thing, as soon as it began to be daylight Sunday morning, they went to the tomb. They weren't going to celebrate the resurrection. They were going to embalm a dead body. In their mind, it was the, the least that they could do. Now, what you find as you look at the story is that there was an angel that was there. In fact, two angels. And the angel said to them, you know, the women, they were so distraught that they didn't even think about until they got about halfway to the tomb. Wait a minute. How are we going to get in there? How are we going to get the thing open? I mean, we, there's no way in the world we're going to be able to move that big stone. You know, they hadn't even thought about that part. They were just so set on doing what they needed to do. Well, they got there, and the first thing they saw, oh, the stone's gone. Well, that, that looks good. But then they looked in the tomb, and the stone was gone, and so was Jesus. And an angel said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? You're out here in the graveyard. You look like you're looking for a corpse. You're all, you've got all this stuff and you're trying to... Why are you looking for the living out here in the graveyard? He's alive, just like He told you. Go tell His disciples. They went back. They told His disciples. Peter and John came running out there. In fact, John's the only one. You know, John wrote this. John was an old man about 90 years old when he wrote the Gospel of John. And I think he must have had a chuckle out of remembering that he outran Peter. He's the only one that mentions that. He said, we raced out there and I beat him to the tent. I got there first. You know, he was looking back 60 years earlier. But Peter, when he came huffing and puffing up from the rear, he went running on in. John had sort of stopped at the door, thought about it. John then later stepped in himself and we're told John believed it began to dawn on him what had really happened. Well, he and Peter left, and up until this time, none of them had seen Jesus. John tells us that he appeared to Mary Magdalene. Mark mentions that she was the first one that he appeared to. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. Here, she was just distraught, standing there. He appeared to her when she recognized him. She reached out for him. And Jesus told Mary, in Matthew 20, verse 17, Jesus told her, Touch me not. Don't, don't hold on to me. Why? For I'm not yet ascended to my Father. You go to my brethren and say, I'm ascending to my Father, to your Father, my God and your God. You see, this was early on Sunday morning. Jesus was in the tomb, just as He said, three days and three nights. Uh, Wednesday night, Thursday, uh, Wednesday night, Thursday, uh, Thursday night, Friday, Friday night, Saturday. Three days and three nights. When they got there Sunday morning, the tomb was empty. But he told her, I'm not yet ascended. Why? Because the way sheep offering offered in the temple, that was waived or presented before God to be accepted. You read the story back in Daniel 7, verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought Him near before Him. The time of the wave sheep. The resurrected Jesus Christ appeared to be accepted. Later on that day, He appeared to the disciples and let them touch Him. He appeared to them a number of times over the course of the next 40 days. This was the countdown to Pentecost, beginning on the day of the way sheep. The day that Jesus was presented to the Father and the day that He began to show Himself in His resurrected state to the disciples. Jesus talked about in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Wherefore, he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same that ascended far up above all heavens that he might fill all things. He ascended on high. 
Jesus Christ ascended to be accepted. He ascended on high. He led captivity captive. From the time of Adam and Eve, sin and death has held mankind captive. This world has been enslaved to sin and death, which is the penalty of sin. Paul talks about in 1 Timothy 2.26 how he talks about human beings uh, taken captive of the devil at his will. Satan holds the world or has held the world captive. Jesus Christ led captivity captive. He triumphed over sin in the flesh. He paid the penalty as the Passover lamb, the lamb of God. He made possible our redemption. But brethren, Jesus Christ came out of that grave to make possible our deliverance. He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. You know, we're the days of unleavened bread are the festival of freedom. We're celebrating on this final day, the seventh day, victory and triumph. When you look at the story of the Exodus, it was on the seventh day that Israel came through the Red Sea. When you go through the book of Joshua and you read of the first Passover in the Promised Land, and then in the immediate aftermath of that, they encircled Jericho for seven days, the seven days of unleavened bread. On the final day, the seventh day, which today celebrates, what did they do? They went around the city seven times, blew the trumpet, and the walls came tumbling down. Jericho was symbolic of this world. It was the great citadel city of the Canaanites. It was a type of this world system which collapsed under the leadership of Joshua. Joshua's name, by the way, in Hebrew is the same as Jesus in the Greek. Joshua, who led Israel in, was in that sense a type. Triumph. Victory. You see, if you go to Romans chapter 5, in Romans chapter 5 we're told the meaning of the Passover. Romans chapter 5 and what is it, verse 5, that... um, The uh, or on down Romans 5 and um, verse 8. God commends His love toward us while we're yet sinners. Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. If when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, the Passover pictures reconciliation, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Because he's alive. He didn't just stay in the grave. He came forth three days and three nights afterward, just as he said. Notice here Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You want to stay in Egypt? God forbid! How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more, death has no more dominion over him. No more rulership, lordship. He led captivity captive. Verse 11, likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead unto sin and alive unto God. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it and the lust thereof. Sin, verse 14, shall not have dominion over you. You see, Jesus Christ has fulfilled the penalty of the law. Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Don't you know that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are, to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. God be thanked, you were the servants of sin. But now you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered unto you. Being made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. Verse 22, being, now being made free from sin, become servants to God. You have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He ascended on high. He led captivity captive. He gives, great, he gives gifts unto men. Hebrews 12.2 tells us what? That we are to look to Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. That's why there are two days, two holy days for the days of unleavened bread. The first day and the seventh day is a holy day. Jesus Christ is the author and He is the finisher of our faith. 
It takes a miracle to get us started and it takes a miracle to get us through. You see, brethren, when most of the time when a battle starts or a war starts, the outcome is in question until it's finally over and the smoke clears. The battle, the warfare that you and I are engaged in, it's not a question. Well, you know, I wonder if I can make it. All you have to do is keep your eye on the author and finisher of your faith and just follow him. Because he has already triumphed. He's been accepted by the Father as the first fruits of them that slept. And so those that are Christ that is coming will be raised up. All you gotta do is hold on. All you gotta do is follow where he leads. All you have to do is put one foot in front of the other. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. But rather follow where he leads. Believe him, trust him, and follow him. That's the key. He explains on down in Romans chapter 7, verse 23. The Apostle Paul says in verse 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Paul said, I've made a choice in my mind. I know what I want to do. I know what I believe in. And yet, there are the pulls of my body, and I find myself thinking things and saying things. <clears throat> oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of death? The answer is in the next verse. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. With the flesh, the law of sin. The flesh pulls me one way, but with my mind, I've made a choice. Who will deliver me? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's our deliverer. You see, the days of unleavened bread are about deliverance. The Passover is about redemption. The days of unleavened bread are about deliverance. And today, the final seventh day of the days of unleavened bread is triumph and victory at the conclusion of our being completely delivered and brought out of Egypt. Jesus Christ tells us in Matthew 11, 28 and 29, He says, Come unto Me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and you'll find rest unto your soul. Take My yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come unto Me. You'll find rest unto your souls. You know, the world has been burdened down. The burden, the consequences of sin and death. All of the pain, all of the heartache, all of the things that have burdened this world from the time of Adam until now. The sorrow, the heavy, hard labor and effort, the death, all of the things that are there. Jesus Christ says, come to me. I try it. And through me, you can have deliverance and you can have triumph. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Notice what we're told here in Romans chapter 8. That in verse 7, in verse 16, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. For if the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God, the creation itself was made temporary, subject to vanity. The creation itself, verse 21, shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. This festival, the day, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, a festival of freedom, a festival of deliverance. Ultimately, the whole world is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, anticipating the glorious liberty delivered from the bondage of corruption. E Egypt was what? The house of bondage. Deliverance. Redemption followed by deliverance. Deliverance from bondage, the bondage of corruption. 
into the glorious liberty of the children of God. A festival of freedom and deliverance. And we're here celebrating the final day, the day that pictures and represents triumph, victory, now and for eternity. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.